so we at BDC, um, along with many of our partners in this room, have been working with Upgrade New York to elevate thermal energy networks in New York for nearly two years now. Through this work, it's become clear that there are a lot of misconceptions about thermal energy networks and the opportunity that they present in New York State. Um, so today, I get to invite our amazing panel of experts up. Can you please come up and join me? Um, to help us work through some of the difficult questions and some of the misconceptions. You've already met John Murphy. Um, thank you for being here today. Uh, so we also have Jared Rodriguez, the principal of Emergent Urban Concepts. Um, we have Melissa Morrow, principal engineer at National Grid. And we have Eric Walker, energy justice senior policy manager at We Act for Environmental Justice. You'll see uh, Ka Wei on the screen. Unfortunately, Ka is sick today and couldn't join us. Um, so I'm going to direct questions at particular panelists, but I hope you all feel free to jump in when you have something to add. I definitely want this to be a discussion. Um, thanks to the first panel, we can skip over some of the more basic what are thermal energy network questions. Um, but there still might be some misconceptions about this technology and how it's deployed. So I want to start with a question for Eric. Um, Eric, can you start with a quick overview of neighborhood scale decarbonization um, and, and what you see as some of the benefits? Hi, everyone. I just want to uh, thank John for a rousing introduction to this panel. <laughs> <laughs> that should, that should not not overlook the need for motivation and an uh, aspirational call to action. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much, John. Um, I also want to take a particular moment to shout out uh, the people of color in this room. It's very, it's not very often we have uh, as diverse a room full of people as we have right now uh, engaged in some of the most important and transformative energy work that cuts across scale from the community to the state to the national level. So, uh, <laughs> on to the questions. <laughs> so um, so I, I approach this really simply. I'm going to uh, say something that, that other folks in the panel I will add some layer of uh, complexity to. But I, I think of thermal networks really as one of many approaches to meeting a series of basic needs. Right? We have a really serious problem around both energy affordability and energy security across multiple uh, types of buildings and demographics within the state. Right? There are three and a half million uh, LMI households in the state that, are quali that essentially qualify for some form of energy assistance. I just want to say that again, three and a half million um, according to the latest uh, estimates that are available. And that is, that's really kind of scary with over 1.7 billion. Folks at the department, please correct me if these numbers are inaccurate, but about $1.7 billion in utility arrears that remain uh, outstanding. And that to me signals a real need to invest in, <clears throat> excuse me, the kinds of interventions at the system level that provide both I mean, this is a, the energy trilemma, right? It's energy security, it's energy sustainability, and it's uh, energy well, sustainability, security, and affordability, right? So we need to think about that at, across scale. So I think of thermal energy networks as a way to meet those, uh, those needs. And as an organizer, I think about how those three, the energy trilemma impacts people on the ground most closely. And so when we, uh, I think Troy said, very like astutely at the towards the end of the last panel was that like a lot of this is going to take shape. There's an importance of, of how thermal energy networks take shape and support uh, the transition at the city scale. And so I I really think about thermal energy networks as uh, a way to, to provide the most ground up right ground up intervention to support community decarbonization across multiple building types across multiple populations that has modularity and scalability to support the very, very ambitious goals that we have in this state, as John so eloquently noted. So I would like to just maybe start like 
that as a level set, like how are we gonna think about these really kind of technocratic solutions as ways to meet basic needs for people who are often not even discussed in the conversation around what our energy and economic development agendas are in the, in the state, right? They are mar they're literally left into the conversations of like energy assistance dockets and not <laughs> brought to the tables of conversations like this. So I wanna start there. Thank you so much. We don't have a lot of slides for this panel, but I do just want to put up this example of a thermal energy network and neighborhood scale building decarbonization so we can um, keep that in mind for the discussion. I want to next ask Jared. Um, so there's a lot of debate about the best way to decarbonize buildings in New York State. We heard some of this um, in some of our introductions about, about some of the different options. Can you share a little bit about the situations or locations where a thermal energy network should be considered and a little bit about the benefits that they bring? Yeah, I mean, huge conversation. We can't have it all today. Um, but I, I mean, honestly, and just maybe to start, right, there, we heard so many words <laughs> uh, in the last panel and just in general in this room, there's so many words. And each word we pick kind of conjures like a particular idea. I think the conversation around thermal energy, right, and, and what is a thermal energy network, and it's like a hug, but it's actually a pipe, but it's a hug, but it's a pipe. Um, you know, this stuff is complex, and there's, there's too many words, right? And I think it really behooves all of us here in the room, including the regulators and, and policymakers, to kind of just pick some and agree upon what we're calling things. Um, I, and I think we can make those words like neutral so it doesn't trigger anybody either, right? Because some words are, are unhappy words and other words are, are great words, right? Like hug's a pretty good word, right? Um, so one of, the, one of the things that I'm most excited about is just like landing on a common language. Um, I think the regulator, uh, the Department of Public Service is doing this uh, in an incredible way. Like I've never participated in any um, uh, heated debates over words um, until I was able to per participate in a technical conference recently, and we'll continue doing that metrics, right? Um, Greg, uh, Greg Camulos previously was talking about one of the projects, and he said, it's got a giant chiller, 2,000 tons, and it's like, what does that even mean? You know, well, the 2,000 tons is seven megawatts, and you know, in Europe, they don't have different metrics for heating versus electricity, so like, can we just do that too? so that we all know what we're talking about. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, Trey also mentioned um, heat plans in Europe, like Var they're called Varmaplan in, in Germany. Um, and every town is doing a heat plan, right? Like to his point, this is fundamentally a land use, economic development, holistic transition, not just of our energy systems, but of like a holistic place where people actually live and function and do business and hug each other, right? So we, we, we need to be thinking about it that way, right? This is not happening in a vacuum. It's happening in real, actual places. I'm, a, I'm an elected trustee in the village of Sleepy Hollow, and we grapple with these like very specific issues, like, oh crap, we've got this neighborhood that has four inch potable water pipe and that's like illegal now. Like, what are we gonna do, right? Well, can we think about how our community is evolving anyway and where we can tie this in. Because if we're gonna rip up the streets to do potable water pipe, then maybe we should lay some additional pipe to do something else, right? I think that's extremely important. It kills me every time I see those yellow striped pipes going in, like the plastic pipes for gas. And the street is entirely opened and it's fully disruptive and I know that we're gonna to have to come back and do it again. I mean, I know it. And people say, well, when are we gonna to have to come back and do it again? And I'm like, hopefully soon and we could get it over with. Um, so just on that point, like how are we targeting? Well, we're kind of targeting everything. Everything's on the table, okay? This is a tool. It's not the tool, it's one tool of a few. And we have to think about what are our existing plans. If you don't have a plan, have a plan. Every town should have a comprehensive plan, just FYI. If your town doesn't have a comprehensive plan, you're, you know, you're many steps behind. But every plan, or every town has a plan, how can that plan be slightly tweaked just to incorporate this? Um, and I think that that's, that's really how we should be, be approaching this. Yeah. 
Um, thank you. And you know, we could talk about this theoretically all day. Luckily, we have Melissa here to help us ground these in some projects. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you envision the National Grid pilot proposals in both Troy and Syracuse? Um, what's unique about these projects and how are they situated to be effective thermal energy networks? Yeah, sure. So, um, uh, hi everyone. Um, so we tried to um, choose our pilots based off of them having some unique qualities. So, um, for example, the, the Troy project is, um, I believe, the only of the utility proposed projects where um, the utility is not going to own the, the thermal source. Um, it's going to be uh, a core field owned and operated by Troy LDC. Um, and then we are going to purchase the thermal energy from from Troy LDC to uh, put into our utility distribution system and distribute to our customers. Um, with Syracuse, the unique factor is that we're utilizing the wastewater treatment plant um, as our thermal source. None of our uh, other pilots, all the other pilots that National Grid in particular is doing um, are geothermal related. So um, this is a really interesting one as well. We're utilizing or we're planning to utilize the um, uh, outfall of the Metro Wastewater Treatment Plant in Syracuse to um, bring energy to a couple of the commercial or over a dozen of the uh, commercial and multifamily residential buildings uh, in the downtown area of Syracuse, um, the inner harbor of Syracuse, and uh, that's including the new aquarium that they're looking to as well. So um, those projects actually came to National Grid um, through the NYSERDA on 4614 effort. Um, so that was kind of good for us. These projects seem like a good a good fit and we're working with the folks who were um, initially developing them to just take them all the way, um, which we thought was a, a good first go for a utility in trying to do these. Um, but yeah, we, we really just want, wanted to do something that could help disadvantaged communities. Both of the projects are in disadvantaged communities. There are going to be educational pieces, um, at least that we're aiming to try and put into each of the the pilots so that way we can educate communities on how these operate and um, maybe get folks on board for a future expansion of each of the projects which the, the wastewater treatment plant alone can actually do up to two to four times um, what we're proposing in a first pilot so there's plenty of room for expansion there um, so as Greg was talking about before we're picking some buildings that are interested right now and then hopefully uh, grabbing others along the way as we expand. Thank you so much. I feel like um, one of the misconceptions we've seen and the first panel was able to talk about it a bit is that people thought that these systems would be built and then they would live statically there forever, right? But there is this ability to expand and scale. And I'm wondering, um, Jared or, or anyone else in the panel can talk a little bit about how we see that happening, how systems can be built to prepare for that expansion and, and scaling. You want, to, you want me to take that? Okay. Um, so, yeah, so what's really interesting is, and you know, Greg again from Con Ed, he hit this, uh, I think, really well with the Chelsea project. That project was conceptualized as a project that extended from Hudson Yards down to the Google building at 111 8th Avenue, and using the High Line as a right of way to share heat, right? So very large project. Um, and then, you know, the pilot, the pilot proposal came together and it had to get paired back. Right? We don't have endless amounts of money to do these pilots. But I think starting with the big, the big concept, the big plan, and then modularizing that, right? Like breaking it down into where are my thermal energy resources in my community or in my neighborhood? Where are my off takers or the folks that I'm matching with? Um, and how do I most efficiently connect? Right, it's really important to note, like a thermal energy network isn't one thing. It's not a, a particular size either. There's thermal energy networks that are in existing buildings, right? Like in this building right now, this room is getting a little bit hot, right? Because there's a lot of people in here. Um, it's gonna get cooled. And like Indu was saying, either we're gonna take that heat and reject it out of the cooling tower on the roof and waste water doing that too, on a day when we could be heating things, or we're gonna send it back through the building, take some heat out, make domestic hot water, or send it to a room that needs some heat. It's like we could do thermal energy networks in individual buildings, right? We know of buildings that have grocery stores on the ground floor and there's people living above. We can do a thermal energy network in that building and make the domestic hot water from you know, the ice cream freezers. So just we need to get it out of our heads that this is a thing and it's objectified and it has like bounds. It's not. It's an idea, it's a, an approach. 
Um, and there's a lot of different design approaches and different project development approaches that we can use to deploy them strategically. And I think strategic is the exact right term here because we have to be doing multiple things with one thing. I think that's the name of the game in climate action in general, is we need to be using infrastructure to perform multiple duties as much as humanly possible um, because we don't have unlimited resources to waste like we've done for the past 200 years, right? We just don't. We're squeezing less and less from the resources that we have. Um, so yeah, I think that's the key takeaway. Great, thank you. Um, so let's move to, to talking about some of the benefits of thermal energy networks. I think we heard um, we heard utilities talking a little bit about you know how to make sure customers are are on board, how to include more customers. I'm hoping that Eric can talk through um, what some of the benefits of tens are and decarbonize buildings in general for the customers, for people who live in them and work in them, um, and a little bit about how we can be sure that um, customers and people who live in these buildings are protected. I wasn't prepared to answer this question right now. So I'm going to take a second to gather myself. Um, I, I'll open this again up to, I don't profess to be a, a, an expert about anything in the world. I just have a good like BS sniffer. And so um, when certain things come across my desk and I get asked to, to like talk about it, I'm like, that smells like some BS. Like, or it smells good. So. I, I think what excites me about about this is again this this energy trilemma, right? And when we talk about energy security as the first and foremost kind of thing from a strategic perspective to consider, right? We have to think about the ways in which we're going to provide reliability and safety to customers across the uh, across a district, a building, a service territory, etc. Now, I mentioned yesterday that we need to have a fundamental conversation about what safety and reliability mean for different folks uh, because I think we also don't have a common definition of what those things mean and because and because of that it causes tension between different rate uh, payers and customer classes and all sort of thing uh, with different interests but winding back, uh, the benefits here are first and foremost security, right? This is a, a pretty reliable way to uh, transfer uh, energy between different different buildings that helps create a, 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 lower, uh, a lower sort of uh, energy profile for a given building or across a given building set. So I used to uh, be the director of energy in Erie County and we have an existing a district heating system that we use, and we really pretty quickly realized that we were uh, we had underutilized capacity to extend that uh, district uh, sort of set of buildings that we were using for multiple purposes to, to offer more capacity to other buildings and bring in and expand a, a district system, right? And so we were even we even did a study to think about bringing in. Erie, Lake Erie water to support that thing. It didn't go over well. County, it was going to cost us too much money. County executive didn't want to do it. I don't blame them for it. It's expensive. And the politics just don't work out when you spend money as a local government official. So um, that all aside, my point here is that at a neighborhood level scale, which is where I always start this conversation, is, is when, and specifically talking about the, the SUNY campus project, right? The, this is a throwback to the red days, which is where I started my work here. Reforming the energy division. Raise your hand if you know what that is. Okay, good, okay. So for those of you who don't know what the reforming the energy vision is, it was an, an ambitious framework for how the uh, state was going to begin opening up uh, the energy system to increase customer engagement new business models and uh, an ambitious set of frameworks for getting incre and increasing energy efficiency and all the like. I won't bore you with that, you can Google it. Um, it, it was a beautiful thing in some ways and, and incredibly scary in others. But what it did was offer us a very <coughs> clear framework for how we were gonna move the 
state forward. So I'm rambling a little bit only to say that um, this framework is super important for clarity amongst multiple actors in a, in a, uh, in a field, right? Uh, now I'm gonna start, I'm gonna be quiet. For residents, we need who don't participate in rate cases, who don't participate in generic policy proceedings, who don't participate in technical conferences, who don't participate in spaces like this, we get that sense of clarity from the piece of paper that comes to us every month, right? And how does that, how do we, to Jared's point, sort of translate that into a sense of certainty when we're sharing thermal energy across buildings? That means less expensive. The short version is less expensive, right? And that energy security from providing thermal energy networks does two things. It cre increases affordability, it increases security, and then ultimately increases our, our opportunity as various buildings connected to these systems to think about uh, outside of um, the competition for scarce resources in one's daily life. I think about that all the time, and I we could spend a lot of time talking about the sort of high level aspects of like what the benefits are, right? Levelized cost of electricity and all sort of jazz, but I'm gonna try and make sure we talk about real people, real lives, and the way this shows up in somebody's pocketbook. Could I just add to that a little yes, bit? Go okay. ahead, please. So um, one thing that I think about all the time, and I said this earlier, is how, you know, how can we use infrastructure to do something else, right? So like, what does that mean in this context? Um, I've been having a lot of conversations with affordable housing developers, and they're really struggling to make these projects pencil out. Like, they're really having a hard time. And the state is throwing resources at them, like, please build housing. And we're not. And we're in, like, serious crisis mode. Do you know how to solve that? Like, Europe has solved this. They had a crisis after World War II when a high portion of their housing was, like, physically destroyed, and government needed to provide housing they created thermal energy networks. And they built the thermal energy networks to provide heating to those buildings so that those buildings didn't have to provide their own heating systems. So that we've done this, we've been through this before. We can reduce the cost of housing, public housing, right, social housing, or any housing, by something like 30%. If we just take the burden off the developer, why does every building have to have its own energy plant in it? That's not smart. <laughs> I think um, to, add, to add to that, some of the conversation earlier talked about the benefits being, you know, and you mentioned the addition of cooling and a warming and a warming planet, um, and you know some of the the benefits to customers around um, decarbonization generally being the indoor health of a building. Sure, um, we all kind of know that. Reducing exposure to thermal extremes is a smart thing to do, right? Again, those 3.5 million households who struggle to pay their utility bills and the $1.7 billion that in the tank that may just be unrecoverable, right? Like, literally unrecoverable uh, because we're not, pay, don't, we're not putting state resources in at the scale that's necessary in order to support uh, making utility companies whole for those arrears or making customers whole for the big bills that they pay. Reducing exposure to thermal extremes is a good thing because it helps reduce that, first off, people's bottom lines. But ultimately, we know that like the big, one of the biggest drivers of upper respiratory illness and cardiac stress is exposure to thermal extremes, right? And that happens in two times, in the middle of the winter and the middle of the summer. And summer is the bigger driver of dead people to, as a function of exposure to thermal extremes than cold is. That's just scientific, it's real, pretty much irrefutable at this point. But the other thing is, it's really just like reducing exposure to indoor toxins, right? We know we act, uh, we act for environmental justice did a study that showed that we were exposing people to, to at least like 13% uh, more like uh, off-gassing pollutants like PM 2.5 and stuff inside their houses when they were using gas, uh, using gas as a, as a cooking source. And so like we're just, we got people literally killing themselves 
right? Harming themselves uh, in order to both meet basic needs and do daily functions like eating. That's not cool, and we can eliminate that by moving to different uh, forms of, of, of uh, heating and cooling. I'm gonna pivot us a little bit um, and, and move to, you know, one, one thing we hear a lot about is that thermal energy networks require skilled workers to complete them. And I wanna ask John to tell us a little bit more um, from his introduction about how the New York State pipe trades are preparing to be ready to decarbonize our state through thermal energy networks and what kind of training this requires. Sure, sure, thank you, Nicole. You know, first, I just wanna say how encouraging it is to have these conversations because it's really, it's decarbonization by design. In uh, many cases, the legislature has gotten a little ahead of itself by saying, okay, just ban it, we'll figure it out. And that doesn't work, it's proven that it doesn't work. But this does work, and it's great to have the stakeholders in the same room to discuss it, and it's absolutely awesome. So the New York State Pipe Trades, like most building trades unions, when there is a specific skill required, modules are set up to be able to train members, not just apprentices, but journeyman members to come back to be retrained. In a case of thermal energy networks, using HDPE, high density polyethylene, it's the work that we do right now. You see most of the semiconductor plants use HDPE piping. Heat pump labs we've had in place for many, many years. So just the specifics of a thermal energy network, whether it's the loops, velocity, volume, uh, uh, force, that's all part of our training curriculum. But I think what's most important is that when we have a certainty of work, we know that there's a pipeline of work ahead, it allows building trades unions to recruit from the community, to be able to train the workforce. Can't happen without that work certainty. And what do you, how do you see that looking um, in New York? So I know Upgrade New York has been pushing the state to lead by example. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that vision? Sure. Well, again, with the advocacy of so many great people here, um, what we're looking to do is we need shovel-ready projects. And I can tell you, even for the workers and the members in my industry, when they say, where is our transition? We need to show them this is the path, this is the future, and it's nothing to be afraid of. We can work here. And it, it's not just plumbers and pipe fitters, it's laborers, operating engineers, electricians. We even try to change the narrative from electrification, which set, sets many back on the heels, to decarbonization. Same thing, but it means a lot different to a lot of workers. Unless you're an IBEW member, then you like electrification purely. Um, so, so these are some of the reasons. And, and I can tell you, if I could speak for a second about one of the model pre-apprenticeship pre programs that we have in the state is the New York City Building and Construction Trades where up to 40% of every new class comes from pre-apprentice programs like helmets to hard hats, uh, non-traditional employment for women, pathways to apprenticeship, uh, EJF construction skills initiative, and just recently one was announced with the New York City Housing Authority. And that's real progress. That's how we start to bring more people under the tent. And I guarantee you, an entrance into the building trades is an entrance in the middle class. One of the other benefits I was hoping to talk about, and oh thank you, John, for that, is um, the, the benefits of thermal energy networks to the electric grid. Um, Jared, I know that the cost of these systems has been the subject of a lot of speculation. I'm hoping you can break it down. How do the economics work? How does the electric grid fit into this? I'm going to borrow from um, Audrey Shulman, who's here today, uh, from HEAT, uh, in a conference that I uh, you know, performed on a panel with her last week in Syracuse. She started off by saying, you know, the DOE just released uh, a report about geothermal, specifically about geothermal, like a house has a geothermal system or a building has a geothermal system. It doesn't incorporate thermal energy networks, but it kind of proves a point. Geothermal can reduce peaking loads by 30 or 40 percent. Thermal energy networks can go even further than that. So when you put this in the context of the, we have to electrify the country or the state, and we need to deliver all the wires to do that, and not just the wires, but all the generation to do that, and all the electric storage to manage you know, intermittent renewables. We're talking about a system that is like multitudes larger than what it is today. How do we avoid like gold plating the system and overbuilding it? It's by managing heat. It's by managing our peaking issues, which in the future, it, you know, we're going to peak on the electric grid in February when it's cold, right? And 
you know, like we're having conversations about buildings, like we're not really having conversations about industrial, and we're not really having conversations about transport. And how do these two things interact, right? So if geothermal will reduce by 30% and yield what is likely trillions of dollars <laughs> in transmission projects, generation projects, peaking capacity resources across the country, what can we do if we reduce by 50% or 60%? What if we can have complete control over what our demand is on the system at any given time because we have this big water battery, which is cheaper than a lithium ion battery, to dump energy into and take energy out of? Like, what if we can do that? And we can. You know, this, is not, this is not rocket science. I mean, we're literally talking about pumping water around in a pipe. All of our municipalities already do this. Every single one of them does this. Um, so we've got the capacity, we've got the labor capacity to do it. We've got the know-how to do it. We even have the organizational structures to own, manage, deploy, expand these systems. These, these exact systems, we know how to do it. We just have to do it and stop talking about it. And pick the right words. <laughs> So, you know, we talk about costs, we talk about integrated systems and integrated planning. Um, and something, John, you were talking about around pre-apprenticeship programs, it was an important part of the Utenja bill, um, an important part of our collaboration and, and working toward passing that bill. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about costs in, in terms of prevailing wage and how prevailing wage um, impacts or does not the cost of our project. Sure. So a couple of in interesting things. There was a study uh, commissioned by the Republican State Senate, I believe, in 2018 by Cornell University that showed that every dollar spent on prevailing wage projects, a dollar fifty went back into the community. It's number one. There's also a study out there, it's, it was done by independent project analysis, unassailable uh, study that analyzed over 1,500 industrial and construction projects ranging from $200,000 to $6 billion. And it was comparing total union projects to mixed to total non-union projects. And the results were surprising to many. Producti on union projects, productivity was 14% higher than open shop. Total cost was 4% lower than open shop. And, and union projects were 40% less likely to experience a, a shortage of skilled labor. Because we have the ability to move people from town to town, from state to state. And what we do is re we recruit. We recruit all the time. We're always organi organizing. In fact, I'm leaving here today to attend a critical organizing class in uh, Turning Stone tomorrow. So that's exactly what we do. That's amazing. Well, we appreciate you being here today for this. Um, Eric, I know WEAC's advocacy has been really essential in, in Utenja and otherwise around getting um, residents of disadvantaged communities um, into unions and partnering with, with folks like John to make sure that happens. Do you have anything to add around um, union, union work and, and getting folks into, into family sustaining careers? I'll be, I'll be brief, uh, characteristically. Um, but yeah, we, shout out to, to Charles Calloway, who's our di work, Director of Workforce Development at WEACT, who's worked tirelessly uh, for years to help build these ramps to uh, unionize work in both energy efficiency, offshore wind, and uh, we're beginning to lay the foundations for this work in the, in the building sector connected to thermal energy networks. And so um, we are really excited about building an ecosystem level approach to workforce development that meets people where they're at, but also keeps uh, an eye on how we're going to transition over multiple time horizons into uh, Build, bringing people onto a, like a, a value chain approach to workforce development. So we understand that efficiencies first, right? We understand that there's gonna be some form of electrification that happens next. We understand that while that's all happening, while that's all happening at the building scale, there, there are all these like higher level system order opportunities for our folks to become engaged and trained uh, in things like transmission development or um, offshore wind, for example. But we need to have a, a lattice kind of approach to thinking about what those 
transferable skills are. So as people are beginning to ramp up into energy efficiency, they're also keeping an eye on to what other opportunities they may want to be involved in that are also part of this broader transition. So we want to be thinking with an open aperture about workforce development and we see thermal energy networks as a huge opportunity because of the municipal housing that folks are connected to. We see this like opportunity to make the system real to, to folks in a very tangible eye level kind of way like this building and that building and that building are really what the energy system is about. Not simply this uh, what I think has been a dominant narrative around um, reducing energy. Right, energy utilization, which I think is important, but it's not the entirety of the system. So we're really excited about this. Can I just add a layer to that too? So one of the biggest bottlenecks that I see, and I think John is right, I think the labor force is actually really interesting because it can flex and it can do multiple things. Um, one of the biggest bottlenecks is like, and shout out to like my mechanical engineers in the room, raise your hand if you are one with a professional engineering license. How many? Do we have like what, four? Okay, are there like five? Okay, big deal, right? Um, this is a huge bottleneck. We don't even know what best practices are in the design world. This is a giant bottleneck. I've had to go to Germany and get mechanical engineers to come over here to teach other mechanical, mechanical engineers so that I can buy and design a project. Like what, you know why? Right, when we've got all of these state universities that could be pumping people out. And we have a giant population here that could be pumping people out to serve this need. It's just one hand doesn't know that the other hand is doing something. <laughs> and we all need to talk. We all have to get it into that same language <laughs> so that they know what we're doing. Here we go again. It wasn't just yeah. me. It wasn't just me. Yeah. Um, but ser I mean, seriously, right? Like, if we can couch this conversation in economic development, we already have a whole dictionary of words that we use to talk about economic development and downtown revitalization, right, and jobs, and micron, and chips, and all of this stuff, right? Like, we already talk about that. That's like a pretty mature conversation. Okay, so like, let's talk about heat inside that conversation. That's it. So I just want to give a very clear and specific example of what Jared is referring to. So back, again, Rev reference. The Rev Campus Challenge, right, was an, an effort to try and bring multiple SUNY campuses into the, into the framework of REV by doing three things. Developing projects that helped demonstrate the goals of reforming the energy vision. It also encouraged them to develop uh, curriculum and pedagogical tools to support uh, students across multiple disciplines to, so, to then become uh, kind of integrated into this taking the projects and integrating that into curriculum and pedagogical tools, but also the third thing, which I think was most important, which was uh, using those pedagogical tools to help support career to uh, education and career engagement, not just within the university, but also within the surrounding community. The University of Buffalo has done did a pretty good job of, of that, right? Multiple small, unsung spin-off projects that came out of this, right? Solar development near and surrounding the Northland Workforce Training Center, another four, hundred plus million dollar state investment that spun off multiple, um, both, uh, as the name implies, training centers, but also um, commercial and industrial development. I, I think that is the kind of model that we want to harken back to that is both rooted in leveraging multiple assets within the community, intentionalizing the spin-off effects, but also thinking about this ecosystem level approach that is both project-based um, from its, it has its own uh, thermal energy network project that we are uh, highly excited about uh, right now, but also really thinking about what does that engagement scale look like. So when you see it, again, as I talked about before, you see this in real life, it's not a mystery anymore. You get, to, you get to see something tangible and how it plays out in the community and what may be the opportunity for you and other folks that look like you to engage in this work and then see how it plays out where you go next from here. From your house to your, to your to the workforce or to school or then to project-based work within your community that helps create this economic development spin -off. Thank you so much. I'm gonna ask one more question before we go to Q&A, so start thinking about your questions. Um, Melissa, you gave us um, some, some examples earlier of the projects. We know that the Department of Public Service and the Public Service Commission are working toward rules and regulation to make this a permanent 
program. And so we're looking forward to more rounds of these project proposals and more rounds of um, utility scale thermal energy networks in the future. And I'm wondering if there are any lessons you learned from this first round of proposals and um, if there's anything you know you think you might you might look for in another round of projects. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are currently in stage one of five of this first round of proposals and I feel like already we've gotten so many lessons learned. Um, one of the main ones being just looking at the diversity of the projects that were submitted. I do think um, uh, looking at ways to pro promote projects that use different thermal energies, not just geothermal. I know a lot of the utilities kind of went with geothermal energy um, uh, as a you know starting point, uh, but now how we incorporate those other uh, energy energy sources that we have. I know in our um, it's our downstate project, but in our Kedney project, there is um, there are a couple of different thermal energy sources in the area, such as the MTA subway, um, and that we can look to incorporate into a project that currently would only um, have a geothermal bore field as its source to expand that. Um, so that's, you know, not just looking to add on different customers, but projects with the ability to add on additional thermal sources, um, I think would be really good for a second round um, or third round or fourth, I hope to do these for a while, um, of projects. I also, um, for the utility just in general, I think customer outreach is a much bigger piece of this than we anticipated. You know, we can, um, you know, uh, we can go out every day um, if we can't get customers to buy into this. If you, you know, you lose a critical customer or you don't get enough customers signed up to do your project, there's nothing you can do about it. You cannot do that project. Um, and you can kind of keep, keep searching for those customers. But I think really um, early and often as far as reaching out to customers is something that we've learned thus far that you know, if we choose to do a second round or if we're allowed to do a second round of proposals that um, we would definitely um, beef up our customer outreach right from the get-go just to, you know, ensure that we get the most customers possible. I know even internally, um, as you were saying before with the, the labor workforce, um, folks are, are concerned that, you know, they're not going to have jobs soon. Um, so even internally in our own company, there are folks who aren't aware of all of the um, capabilities and potential of these thermal energy networks. So obviously, you know, somebody, you know, my mom who still asks me how to turn on the TV half the time um, is not gonna know what this is about. So if she gets something in the mail, she's not gonna know what to do with it. Um, so just that education and outreach piece, I think we really need to focus on as we do more of these. Thank you so much.